we are beginning a brand new series today called Christmas is Forgiving. Now, it's actually a play on words, because you can say that, you can read that in two different ways. You can say Christmas is for giving, right? And it is. God gave the greatest gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And because God gave that first gift, we now give gifts to one another on Christmas. Christmas is for giving. It is. But can I also tell you the primary reason for Christmas is Christmas is forgiving, God wants to forgive us of our sins. God gave us the greatest forgiver that's ever been, that's Jesus Christ himself, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Did you know that over and over again, when the angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they told us that's why Jesus was born. Check it out. Look at this passage found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. This is what the angels said to Joseph. It says this, and she, Mary, will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came, why? To forgive us. Jesus came to save us from all of our sins. And so the greatest Christmas gift any of you could receive today is forgiveness from God. But here's the deal. Because God has now forgiven us, we in turn are supposed to learn to forgive one another. And this is especially true during the Christmas season. You go, why? Because the Christmas season, the holidays are packed full of potential hurts with your family. You see, the reality is, is that a lot of us, we go into the holidays with a little fear and trepidation because we basically say things like this. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it through the holidays. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just survive the holidays. Why? Because the holidays have a way of magnifying the hurts and the pains that have happened in our past with these people. And so what do we do? We, we're like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna just try to be cordial during the holidays to these people who would have offended me and hurt me unless they really tick me off. And then, you know what? I'm gonna release you know, my wrath on them, but I'm gonna try to be cordial. I'm gonna try to be Christian. And then of course, whenever I get in the car and leave, I'm gonna talk bad about them on the way home, right? And that's sort of the way we do it, all right? Now you go, well, why is it, why is it that the holidays create hurt? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I, I mean, one is, you know, just the holiday shuffle. I mean, you know what that is, right? I mean, basically, in a, you know, a five to seven day period of time, you're trying to go to multiple events and multiple families. And, you know, it's hard enough with just two families. You add in a divorce in there. And golly, it's really difficult to to make it to everybody's household. And it always has the potential of hurting people. And people get offended. And you start hearing these questions like, why did you spend more time with them than you did us? Or you gave them the best day, and we got the leftover days, right? And there's all that potential for hurt. I heard about this one guy who he decides that the very first Christmas, he, they would spend Christmas with her family, and then the next year, he'd spend Christmas with his family. But his mom was peeved. I mean, she was like, oh, I can't believe it. Why would you choose her family over our family? I can't believe you did that, right? And, and so, you know, he thought, okay, you know what? I just think it's a fair, right thing to do. And he didn't think another thing of it till the second year and you know he goes to his mom's house for Christmas and and he notices that under the Christmas tree there's these big stacks of gifts for everybody except for his wife she just has one little gift it was just a a little you know a um, body sponge (laughs) and everybody felt awkward except the mom she thought that's justice right I mean the fact is is that okay you know what Christmas has the potential of a lot of drama. And then you add into all of that what I call the psycho factor. You go, psycho factor, what's that? Well, I believe that in every family there is a psycho, there's a lunatic. It, it, it's almost like God, I mean, I mean, almost like Satan goes, uh, they need one, and they need one, and they need one, and there you go. Everybody's got one of those, right? I mean, and you know, and it's just one of these people that always say the wrong thing at the wrong time, and you know, they're just a royal pain in the backside, and you just, oh, you know, you just drive crazy. In fact, I believe that every family's got one. In fact, let me just prove this to you, okay? If you've got a psycho kind of person in your family, just, just raise your hand, okay? Raise your hand. Look around. That's almost everybody here, okay? Now, you know, here's the deal. If you didn't raise your hand, It may be you, okay? All right. (laughs) You thought you had a normal family. It's you, right? And so here's the deal. God says, I want you in all these times, there's so much pain, there's so much hurt that can just happen. Um, I want you to forgive the way you've been forgiven. 
that in the midst of all this pain during the holidays, God says this is the perfect time to experience my grace and my forgiveness, and it's the perfect time to forgive those who have hurt you. Because you've been forgiven, you are now in a position to forgive others. In fact, God says you're obligated to forgive others. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this passage in Matthew chapter 18, and you have the apostle Peter who comes to Jesus with really a great question. It's probably a question that you've thought of even yourself. And Peter has been hearing Jesus teach about forgiveness and how important it is, and so he's got this question. He's probably got a person in his mind, but he comes to Jesus and he asks a really great question that probably all of us would ask. Look at it. It's Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter asked, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Have you ever noticed it's easy to forgive somebody once or maybe even twice, right? You go, okay, hey, you know what? I'm going to let that pass. I'm going to look past that. But whenever you have somebody who is a multiple offender, they're like psychological sandpaper in your life, it becomes a lot more difficult to forgive those kind of people, right? And so Peter's like, how many times do I need to forgive this person? I mean, then he goes, seven times? I mean, he's, he's thinking, I'm being amazingly gracious here. I, I need to forgive him seven times? And in that day, it was gracious. Why? Because the Pharisees said, you only had to forgive somebody three times. It's almost like three strikes, boom, you're out, you're done, right? So Peter doubles that number, adds another one just for bonus, and he comes to Jesus and says, how, how many times? seven times now again I believe that Peter has somebody in his mind I mean this isn't a the theoretical theological question he this is a practical question there is somebody who has offended him multiple times I'm just gonna guess and he's forgiven them seven times okay and so now he comes and he says okay Jesus I'm about done and so tell me how many times do I need to face this person now I believe that every one of us, whenever we hear the question, there's probably a name that comes to our mind. There's probably a face, there's probably an event, there's probably a hurt, and we ask the same question that Peter asked. How much? Lord, tell me, how much is too much? How much um, times, how much hurt is greater than the grace I'm supposed to extend? You know, where does this whole thing stop? And again, Peter thought seven was a perfect number, right? He was being extremely gracious. I imagine that Peter, when he said seven times, he was probably grinning from ear to ear. And he's like, oh. he's, he probably has his hand out thinking that Jesus is about to give him the disciple of the year award, right? I mean, I mean, he's sort of expecting Jesus to go, Peter, why can't the rest of my boys, rest of my disciples be as gracious as you are seven times? That's amazing, Peter, that's amazing. But then what Jesus says stuns everybody who's listening. Look at what Jesus says in verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Some translations say 70 times seven. Now, Jesus is not giving us a math problem here. He's not saying, okay, I want you to keep score. There's one, there's two. Okay, there's 77, or if it's, you know, 490, the next one, boom, I'm nuking you, right? That's not what Jesus is not saying. No, Jesus has given us this perfect number that basically says you don't ever count. You, you keep no record. You, it goes on infinity. It's just like saying how long are we commanded to love one another? There's no end to that. Same way with forgiveness. There is no end to our forgiveness. It's like somebody has offended us. We go, that's one. And then they offend us again. We go, no, not that's two, we go, that's one. See, we, we keep no record. We do not keep any records of wrong. Now, some of you, when you hear this, you go, this is hard, or this is impossible, or somebody about to blow a gasket. Why? Because you know somebody who's hurt you again and again, and you, you, you're, in your mind, you're thinking, Pastor Jonah, you don't know. You don't know what kind of pain, what kind of grief this person's caused me, what kind of agony they've brought me through. I mean, I've forgiven in the past. I'm just, I'm done. Why in the world would I choose to forgive somebody? Well, here's the key point. I want you to jot this on your outline. Here's the key takeaway. God forgives us. Why? So that we can forgive others. Jot that down. God forgives us. Why? So that we can forgive others. 
And what Jesus is gonna do is he tells this story in Matthew chapter 18, he's gonna give you an understanding of the cost of forgiveness. This is what it costs God to forgive you, and this is what it's gonna cost you to forgive other people. And so I want you to jot down these three amazing principles about forgiveness on your outline. The first one is this, jot this down. First of all, forgiveness requires sacrifice. Forgiveness requires a sacrifice. You've heard the expression, there's no free lunch. Well, there's no free forgiveness either. Now look, I know that our forgiveness by God is completely free to us, but can I just tell you something? It cost God a lot. It was very costly for God to forgive us. Jesus gives us an understanding of how costly our forgiveness is in this parable. Check it out, look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. The Bible says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. In your outline, circle 10,000 bags of gold. Literally in Greek, it's 10,000 talents. Now, whenever the hearers of Jesus' story would have heard that number, they would have gasped or they would have giggled. They would have thought, there's no way anybody would have loaned that kind of money. There's no way that anybody could pay back that kind of money. You go, well, well, what does that equal? 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold. Let me see if I can put it in perspective. In that day, the taxation of the entire Roman Empire was less than 10,000 talents. In that day, a person, a regular working person, you know what? He would have to work 20 years in order to earn one talent. That means 10,000 talents. That would mean you'd have to work 200,000 years. Today's money, it's about a debt of $10 billion. It's an unpayable, it's an astronomical debt. This guy owes the king this huge debt, okay? So what's he gonna do? He needs to file bankruptcy. Well, back then, they didn't have chapter 11, they didn't have chapter 13. If you couldn't pay back a debt, what would happen is that the judge would then take you all that you have and sell it, take your wife, take your children, they'd be sold into slavery. You would go into a debtor's prison where you would work hard labor until you paid off the debt. That was bankruptcy back then. And so this man realizes, oh my goodness, this is gonna be bad for me and my whole family, and so he begs for mercy. Now what's amazing is, he just asks for a little bit more time, okay? He does, I'll pay it back, check it out. Look at it, verse 26, it's ludicrous what he says. He goes, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. (laughs) I just need a little bit more time. Give me a little bit more time, I'll pay this back. And you go, there's no way you could pay back that debt. Can I just tell you, before this guy pays back, you know what, hell will freeze over, monkeys will fly, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton will become best friends before (laughs) this guy pays back, okay? Can you tell, this is impossible. It's never going to happen. Now, can I just tell you the symbolism? What's really going on here? I hope you understand the symbolism. The debtor, that's you and I. The debt of $10 billion, that's our sin debt before God. The king represents God himself. The problem with most of us is we do not really understand the huge debt God's forgiven us. We don't. See, we're worshiping Almighty God who is perfect and sinless, and we look at ourselves and go, I'm not really that bad of a person. I'm really okay. You know what? And you know what? I can somehow work this debt off. If if I can just do enough good, man, I can eventually pay off the debt that I owe God. But can I tell you something? One day you're going to stand before the presence of Almighty God, and all your sins will be exposed. See, he sees it all. He knows it all. Now, you're Teacher may not know that you plagiarized that paper, but God does know. And your husband may not know that you flirted with that guy at the gym, but God saw it. And you may have erased the history on your computer, but God saw the websites you went to. See, God sees it all, and one day you will stand before holy, almighty God and give an account. Okay? And so you have this huge astronomical debt and you think, okay, if I'm just good, you know, I do enough good to outweigh my bad or maybe I go to church enough, then somehow that's going to pay it off. It is ridiculous. 
It's an impossible debt. You can never pay this thing off. You can't. Neither can we. Neither could that man. That's the whole point here. We owe God this astronomical debt. We can't pay it off. That's the gospel. Now, there's an assumption here that even though the guy asked for more time, the assumption is the king's going to go, hey, no way. You're going to prison with everything that you own, right? But amazingly, the king doesn't do that. And that's how we understand the sacrifice that God was willing to make to forgive us. And so what does he do? He's going to forgive rather than throw the guy in prison. Which leads to the second truth about forgiveness. First, it's sacrificial. Second is this, jot this down. Forgiveness requires canceling the debt. Forgiveness requires canceling the debt, okay? This guy, he just gives me a little more time. The king is so gracious, he doesn't give him more time. He doesn't change the terms. He doesn't lower the interest rate. What does he do? He forgives it. Check it out, verse 27. The servant's master took pity on him. Look at it. Cancel the debt and let him go. In your outline, circle the word canceled the debt. Cancel the debt. You go, what does that mean? That means he wiped it clean. Slate's clean. You know, books are put away. Nothing's hanging over you. Now, again, there would have been a collective gasp when this happened. <gasps> what? The king would do that? Why? Because everyone knew that in order for the king to pay off this bad debt, he had to what? He had to go into his own treasury, pull out $10 billion, and pay it off. It was going to be a huge sacrifice for him to do that. So that's what's happening here. But now, I want you to understand, we need to move from this courtroom setting. Now let's move to the cross, because that's where this all happened. See, that's where Christ paid the sin debt. The Bible says, he who had no sin became sin for us. That on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, of all of humanity, of all time, and he bore it on the cross. We, we, we had a sin debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. That's what Jesus did. Now, you want some good news, folks? When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just pay the down payment. He didn't just, you know, give us a few installment loans. No, when Jesus paid our debt, he paid it in full. Do you remember what Jesus cried from the cross? One of the last things he said? Look at it. It's John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus said from the cross after he had carried all of our sins, he then cried out from the cross, it is finished, right? You've heard me teach on this before. In Greek, it's the Greek word tetelestai. You go, what does that mean? It means paid in full. In that day, if you had a bill, you would have that bill, you'd have that invoice, and then once you had paid off all that bill, what the person would then do is he would write paid in full over that receipt. You know what Greek word he would put over that? Tetelestai, paid in full. Whenever Jesus forgave you, folks, he forgave every bit all the sins of the past, all the sins of the present, all the sins of the future. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. The debt's been paid in full, right? That's what Jesus did for us. So now I have a question for you. Who owes you? Who do you want to grab around the neck and say, pay me back what you owe me? Pay it back. You see, God expects us to show the same kind of grace that we've been forgiven. And that's where the pushback is. We're like, but, but Pastor Tony, you don't know. You don't know how they hurt me. They, they owe me. And you know what? I believe they do. They do. They may owe you a childhood. They may owe you a marriage. They may owe you a bunch of money. They may owe you at least an explanation, right? They owe you. I get that. But whenever you forgive somebody, what you do is you forgive them the same way God forgives you. When you were helpless and desperate and there was no means of you making it right, God forgave you. Can I tell you, that's how God expects you to forgive others. Every time in the Bible we are told to forgive others, do you know what God always points to to motivate us to forgive others? You know what it is? It's his forgiveness of us. Look at it, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, says this. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. Look at it. Just as God also forgave you in Christ. Listen to me. You will, be never, you will never be asked to bestow more grace on somebody than what you've already received. You will never be asked to forgive somebody more than what you've already been forgiven. God expects you to forgive the way you've been forgiven. I love this quote. I don't know who said it first, but I think it's so true. You see it on the screen. We are most like beasts when we kill. We're most like men when we judge, but we're most like God when we forgive. God expects us as children of God to forgive the way we've been forgiven. Forgiveness requires a sacrifice. It will cost you. Forgiveness means you are, you know, releasing them of the debt. But there's a third thing about forgiveness, and it's this. Jot this down. Forgiveness requires releasing the person. Forgiveness requires releasing the person. See, there's always a person behind the pain. And God says, I want you to let go of them. Look at how Jesus does this in verse 27. The Bible says, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and did what? And let him go. Circle, let him go. You see, what you've got to do for forgiveness to be complete is you not only say, okay, I'm canceling the debt, what they owe me, but I'm releasing them. I'm letting them go. Can I just tell you, some of you, you need to let it go. You need to let them go. In fact, I want you to do this. Turn to the person next to you and just say, let them go. Let them go. You need to let them go. That's what God's saying here. You've got to let them go. Um, now, you may say, well, but, but, but again, Pastor, you don't understand um, how much or what they owe me. You know, when I grew up, I was raised, and you probably were as well, with this basic principle. If I've hurt somebody and then I find out about it, I need to go try and make it right. And I believe that's a good biblical principle. It's called restitution. And we are supposed to live that way. But somehow we, we have an unbiblical concept of forgiveness. Because what we do is we then equate forgiveness in this way. Well, I will not really release and forgive this person until they make it right. Can I just tell you, that's wrong? That's wrong. That's not forgiveness. But, but, but they need to make it right. Well, can I tell you something? What happens if they can't make it right? Some of you have been hurt by people, and it doesn't matter what they do. They can't make it right. Can I tell you, that was our standing before God? We, we couldn't make it right. We weren't able to make it right. There was no amount of good that we could have done to make this thing right. We couldn't. And God says, I forgave you when you couldn't make it right. I'm asking you to make it right, not make it right. I'm asking you to forgive even when they don't make it right. You go, but, 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 but I just, I don't feel like it's justice, right? I, this doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem just. You, you know what? We don't sing amazing justice around here. We, we sing amazing grace around here, right? It's all grace. That's what God wants us to do is to share grace. And you go, but, but I can't let them off the hook, and that's the point. You're still hooked to them. You're still hooked to the offense, still hooked to the pain. You're still hooked to them. They've gone on with life, and you haven't. You're still stuck in that pain. And you'll continue to be stuck in that pain until you finally say, God, I'm forgiving them, I'm releasing them, I'm letting them go. You may go, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I mean do I just let go of my herd and they just go to some mystical place and disappear somewhere? No. What you do is, you release the hurt to God, and he's the healer of that hurt. And then what do you do? You release that person to God. You, you see, they're off of your hook, but when you take them off of your hook, you know what happens? You put them on God's hook, you know? What, what I've learned a long time ago is that whenever we don't release the person and we try to hang on to them, you know what we're actually doing? We're playing God. We are. And God basically says, you know what? As long as you want to play God, I'm going to let you. And I'm not going to be involved in this situation. But as soon as you release him to me, God says, I've got this. Check it out. Look how the Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Paul says, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. 
And whenever you are hanging on, even if you're not doing anything physically to them, in your heart, in your emotions, you're like, I have a right to this bitterness, and I'm not going to let them go because I have a right to these feelings. You know what you're doing? You're playing God. And God said it is time to release them to him. And then God says, okay, I've got it. And whenever you release that person to the Lord, watch out. That's when God begins to start working. So let me recap this story for you. There's a king. We all have a king. His name is Jesus. We all owe this king an astronomical debt we can't pay. Oh, about 10 billion sins we owe him. We can't pay it off. And yet he is extremely gracious. And what does he do? He forgives us. He casts all our sins as far as the east is from the west, even though we couldn't pay off the debt. And now he's asking you, the way you've been forgiven, the way you've been shown grace, I want you to give that grace and forgiveness to other people around you. Now, some of you are gonna hear all that and you go, "Mm -mm. I hear it, I'm not doing it. You know, I'm not doing it. Well, let me give you a warning. It's one of the strongest warnings Jesus says in the Bible. Look at it, it's found in Matthew chapter six, verse 14. Jesus says this, for if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly father will forgive you as well. That means God's grace is gonna flow into your life. And we all need grace, don't we? Verse 15, though, but if you don't forgive others, your father will not forgive your offenses. You go, what does that mean? That means the grace of God stops. That means you have blocked up the grace of God. God wants to be gracious to you, but as long as you keep taking matters in your own hand and you're unwilling to forgive, God says forgiveness is so critical, I will not bestow my grace on you anymore as long as you hang on to that bitterness and unforgiveness. That's what God's saying here. You you see, some of you, you're going through stages of your life and you go, you know what, I don't understand. The Bible says that God's grace is sufficient, but I don't seem like God's grace is sufficient in my life right now. Could it be the reason why you don't sense the power of God and the grace of God in your life is because you are holding on to bitterness of your past? God says, forgive, and when you forgive, then the grace begins to start flowing again. That's the warning Jesus gives us here. This is a serious deal to God. Now, I get it. This is hard. This is painful. But you know what you got to have? You got to have the willingness to say, yes, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to obey you. I don't understand it. My feelings will catch up later. I'm going to choose to obey you. Let me give you two steps to help you in this process of forgiveness, all right? And I want you to jot them on your outline. The first step of forgiveness is this. Jot this down. Stop thinking about what's been done to you and start thinking about what's been done for you. You, for you to really make this choice of forgiveness, you need to quit focusing on the pain and every time you know that pain is triggered and that memory, painful memory is triggered, stop focusing on that and then what do you start doing? You start focusing on what God's done for you. Let me see if I can illustrate it like this. I have here a, um, a bunch of books and um, each one of these books has about 600 pages. And let's just say that... Um, on every page contains 50 offenses, 50 sins, 50 hurts, all right? And so that means that in one book, that would be 30,000 sins and offenses. A lot, right? So there's 30,000, all right? And then at another book, 60,000. Another book, um, 90,000. Another 120,000. Let's see, 150,000. Um, here's 180,000, help me out, 210,000, 240,000, um, 270,000, 300,000 sins, okay? So that represents 300,000 sins. That's a lot of offenses, isn't it? A lot of hurts that's going on right there. Did you know that for us to get 10 billion it would require 330,000 books. It would completely fill up this entire auditorium with books filled with individual offenses. God says, that is what I've forgiven of you. You get in it? You think you're a righteous dude? You're not. God sees us for who we really are in our heart of hearts. He sees us. 
And now God says, what I want you to do is I want you to contrast what they've done to you versus what I've done for you. Let's just say, okay, you know what? This represents a 50 offenses and, and maybe, okay, this is 100 or maybe they've really hurt you a bunch. Okay, this is 150, this is 200. Maybe it's 270. Jesus says, do the math. Compare. Look at how much I have forgiven you versus how much they have hurt you. Let me say it again. God will never ask you to forgive more than what you've been forgiven. God will never ask you to bestow more grace on somebody else above what he's already bestowed on you. Focus on what you've been forgiven, not the offense. That's how you're gonna forgive. If you focus on this, you'll never, fo you'll never forgive. Focus on this. Second way to help you in forgiveness is this. Jot this down. Choose to release your hurts rather than rehearse them. Choose to release your hurts rather than rehearse them. See, our, that's our tendency. We've been hurt and we replay the hurt again and again and again. We replay it over and over again to ourselves and people around us. Let me just um, you know, use a business terminology. You can either copy them or you can shred them, right? You know the good news? God shreds our offenses. We have a tendency to copy them. Heard about this guy who was new in the office and he was looking at the shredder and he wasn't quite sure how to use it. And so the secretary comes to him and says, what's the problem? And he goes, well, I'm not really sure where to put the paper. And she says, well, it's pretty simple. You just put it right here. And he goes, Zhoo. and he goes, well, where do the copies come out? And she goes, well, this is not a copier. This is a shredder. You know the good news in heaven? God doesn't have a copier, folks. God has a shredder and he casts her sins as far as the east is from the west. And that's the only way you're going to get past the past is to choose not to rehearse your offenses, but to release them, to shred them. That's how you get past this. Now, I get that probably every one of you here, as I've been talking today, there is a person, there is an offense, there is a hurt that comes to your mind, okay? Now, you may go, well, I thought I've already forgiven this person. Well, maybe your forgiveness has been incomplete. Maybe God wants you to be more thorough in this forgiveness, and so this name's come to your mind, and I wanna encourage you here today to start the process of forgiving them. Now, can I just tell you how you may know that you haven't really forgiven them? I'll tell you why, because you still blame them and you still avoid them. You know what you need to do? You need to forgive them the way God's forgiven you.